Hi there, welcome. Uh, we're about to start very shortly, our masterclass. So we're just waiting for, you, uh, for a number of uh, attendees still to join us. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, and we'll get started within the next minute or so. We actually had this scheduled last week uh, and we had to postpone because Ed Chan, who I've got speaking with us today, is, uh, was quite ill and Ed's been, uh, Ed's been trying to shake this flu and uh, he's just persisted. It's still nagging him a bit, but he's going to speak today. So if he coughs a bit, please excuse him, but we're just, you know, really appreciative that he's joining us today. So uh, we're just about to get into it. So thanks to all those people who have made time to join with us. And, and again, thank you for um, you know, being understanding since we've had to postpone, but it's, it's been amazing. We've actually added... Uh, considerable number of people who want to be part of this masterclass. Um, I'm Stan Carlil, Managing Director of DPN, and we've had a number of these live webinars this year. Uh, this one is what we call a masterclass. It's a little bit more technical, it's a bit more advanced, and we've got someone um, who is you know, an expert in this area, and that's Ed Chan. Ed, welcome. It's great to have you today. Thanks, Sam. I do apologise to everybody. I was the one that caused the delay in, the, in, this, uh, in this session, so, um, but I'm here now. Um, Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Look, I just want to let people know about Ed. Ed is just a, a consummate professional. Uh, he's a, an accomplished accountant in his own right. Uh, he's, he's, he's the founder of Chan and Naylor, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But just a bit about Ed himself. He's a great leader, a great mentor. He is passionate about property, about helping people win in life, both from uh, a tax point of view and businesses and stuff like that. He's a man of great integrity, and you know, and, and working with him, you know, he always puts the interests of his clients first. He's also very um, intelligent from an emotional point of view, understanding not just the technical aspects of tax and business, but always trying to match that with a, a person's um, understanding, comprehension, and even you know personality of you know what's best for them. You know, so it's always good to have the blend of a, of a technical expert, but also someone who understands the makeup of people. So uh, you get a lot of benefit out of Ed today. So what I'll do is also introduce Chan and Naylor. Um, and I might just switch the slide deck on right now. So, Chan and Naylor is uh, one of Australia's leading accounting firms. Uh, Ed and uh, Ed Chan and Dave Naylor founded the firm about uh, 16 years ago. Oh, sorry, more than 16 years ago, about 27 years ago, back in 1990 or 28 years now. Mm. Um, they're they're very innovative and they've they, they created a, um, a innovative or, or very specific purpose trust called the Property Investment Trust, and it's it's unique to them. Uh, it, you know. Ed told me the story this a uh, while ago. A lot of people said it couldn't be done. He, he was not deterred. He went through, got a, a, a special ruling from the tax office on that, and that's, I believe, has been recently updated. Yep. Um, uh, Ed has got, th there are 13 Chan Nail offices around the country, and I think you're always adding more to that. Is that right? Ed? Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, great firms and great accountants just like Ed, and Ed just actually mentors each firm and each leader within that firm. Um, he's also the author of a number of books, uh, Small to Great, how to Legally Reduce Your Tax uh, and Wealth for Life. And that there, once he's authored or co-authored with someone else, and I believe uh, Small to Great is, or a couple of these are actually being all re-released again. Is that right? Correct. That's right. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. All right, so look, we, we'll get in. The, the, today's agenda is uh, predominantly around uh, property investment, but spe specifically it's around um, the taxes that surround property investment. So we're gonna talk about the importance of tax planning, Income tax, you know, you know, buying in the right name or, you know, what happens if you're buying the wrong name. Uh, newer property, land tax, and just, you know, what that impact is over time. So what's really critical is that, every, and, and what, we all know this, um, and, you know, Ed talks about, we'll talk about legal tax minimisation. This is not tax avoidance. That's, you'll have to see another firm about that. <laughs> but uh, uh, what and we're going to see here today, you know, we're going to build on this as we go through the different types of taxes. And a lot of people just think there's only one tax and it's just you know, around negative gearing. But there's quite a lot. But we're going to see the impact uh, on a step-by-step -step basis and the cumulative effect uh, that might occur if you just choose to purchase the property in the wrong name, if you don't seek out good tax advice. So DPN as an organisation has worked with Chan and Nail. They're actually our corporate accountants uh, for the last 16 years. And just as a, just a normal habit, we work, whether it's professional business owners or people that have got, you know, could have a form of liability or what have you, or they're going to build a portfolio. It's always fundamental in our process before we actually uh, get our clients to buy a property 
is refer them to accountants, and it could be their own accountant if they've come to us somewhere. But if they felt they haven't had the confidence, we'll refer them to uh, accountants in the Chan Nala group because they do have the expertise to build the right foundation. It's so important to have that right advice and have it from the beginning. And it's, you need to have the right accountants. You know, there are, there, there are accountants and there are other accountants. And, and it's just so important you have the people who understand the ramifications both now and in the future because they are significant. So without any uh, further delay, we'll jump in. And the, the first thing we want to look at today is um, you know the type of taxes today. And probably one of the most important things when it comes down to uh, buying a property, Ed, I find is that whose name should you buy it in? And I, unfortunately, I have found people who have even been advised by accountants to buy in, in the wrong name. And you know, there's a couple of ways you can buy. You can buy, I guess, a, a, an entity. It could be in a couple's name. People think we should just always buy a property, you know, 50-50, you know, joint tenancy, tenants. There's a number of ways of buying it. But I find this could be one of the most significant uh, areas that can have an impact on, um, you know, uh, the, your wealth over time. So maybe you can just walk yes. through that for us. In fact, um, thanks, Sam. In fact, if, um, if you bought it in the wrong name, uh, over a 20 year period, and I say 20 years because it is a long term investment, and often people will buy the property and hold it for the long term, and 20 years is not insignificant to hold it for. Um, you could either save yourself around 600 grand in tax, or you can lose 600 grand in tax, and it's 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 just buying it in the right entity. So over the, and I'll, and I'll go through um, each one of those, there's four, four taxes that you've got to pay, and I'll go through each one of those now and just you know, just drill into the numbers mm, and yeah, uh, show excellent. you how much um, how much you can save. But um, Sam, over the years, over many, many years, because I had a passion for real estate, I used to get a lot of clients come to me and they used to come to me for advice, but also um, they'd, they'd get into a property and they'd have a problem with it. I'm talking about from a tax perspective sure. and an asset protection perspective and an estate planning perspective. And um, over years, you accumulate a lot of knowledge in um, seeing the problems that people can get into and then putting things in place to prevent those problems from occurring. So let's let's just touch on one yeah. of the taxes. And as, as we go through, Ed, you can see here there are four taxes. And again, a lot of people may not know this or they may know this, but they're different, aren't they? They're ones that are at a federal level, national level, right? Correct. Which would, Correct. I guess the first two and the other two are at a state level. Is that right? Correct. That's right. So income tax and capital gains tax is at a federal level and stamp duty and land tax is at a, a state level. Um, so you deal with two different departments, but nevertheless, it's a cost that comes out of your pocket. Yeah. And it could also be different in different states. Is that right? Correct. Well? And, and it's different in different states. And um, and the rules are different. Um, so it's not a simple thing like um, just go and buy a property. And what's very frustrating from an accountant's perspective, I guess, is when a, a client comes to you on a Monday and says, guess what, Ed, I've just bought a property. And, um, and he hadn't got any advice and he's just you know, put the, 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 the property in his name or whoever was there. Now, with investment properties, it's not like your home. So with your home, you can pretty much buy it in you know, whatever name because there's no taxes involved. But if you buy the, an investment property in the wrong name, it could have you know quite significant costs yeah. and and I'll re-emphasize that you can either pay it or you don't pay it and it's simply in the planning. Yeah. So if you plan it correctly, you don't pay it. If you don't plan it correctly, you can effectively pay you know over six hundred grand over a twenty year period on the one property. So that's a lot. So why don't we just begin to unpack that? Yeah. So the first one I guess is you know income tax you know, buying the property in the wrong name, you know, Correct. so different tax brackets, you know, you could have partners that have a different uh, income uh, earning level and different tax brackets. So maybe you can walk through this example yes. and what the impact of that. So t typically um, I often get uh, people that come to me and and, uh, and they've, you know, put the property in joint names or one person's name as opposed to the other person's name, but they've spent no time in planning it and sitting down and working out the the, the, the taxes. So there is income tax. So we're going to look at the income tax side, but the income tax is also broken into short term and long term. So often, if you go to an accountant um, who's not really familiar with this, um, they they often tell you to put it into a person's name who's on the highest tax bracket. So effectively, if your family was someone was a couple who who the husband worked full time and the wife does a bit of um, part time work then often the accountant down the road would say to you, let's put it in the husband's name because from an income tax perspective, 
uh, he's going to get a bigger refund. So let's just look at the numbers here. So let's say we bought a property for 800,000. The expenses like the water rates and council rates and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff runs at about say 12,000. Um, these are just rough numbers. Mm -hmm. Interest rates at about you know 5%. Uh, you could probably pick something up but less than that, but just as a rule of thumb, yeah. Yeah, about $44,000. The rent return is around four to five percent. So I've just used the, I'm just being very conservative yeah. here with the numbers, uh, with four percent. Um, so the actual numbers are uh, the rent received is thirty two thousand. The expenses that are coming off that are, are your property expenses plus the interest on your loan is is about fifty six thousand. So your net loss, which is lost many more money is going out than coming in, is around twenty four thousand. So you've got to fund that out of your own pocket, mm. and then. Um, if you were able to get something new, the depreciation on there is around eight thousand dollars, and that's a conservative figure. It can be more than that, or some less than that, but mm. just take an average of say eight thousand. So you're losing around thirty-two thousand a year. So the tax man, if you held it in someone's name who's on a twenty percent tax bracket, your refund is six thousand four hundred dollars a year. But if the person's tax rate was forty-eight percent then you're getting back $15,360. Now, if you're, if you're a couple who have a, a difference in your tax rates, then and you bought it in joint names, you can see that the, the person who's on the lower tax bracket would lose quite a lot of refund. Mm. And then the person who's on the higher tax bracket would get a decent refund. Now, if you bought it in the, in the person who's on the lowest tax bracket, the difference between the two is around close to 9,000 a year. Mm. So just by getting the name wrong, will cost you about nine grand. Now, if then if you then said to me, oh, okay, let's fix it up and let's fix this 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 name that's on the, on the title, then guess what? You've got to pay stamp duty mm. to get it out of there. And stamp duty is quite, it's quite significant mm. on, on this, at, the, at this level of a property. So it's really important that you go see someone who's not just an accountant, but someone who specializes in this area because he not only looks at it short term, because this is a short term fix, but he also looks at it long term. So let, let me explain what long term mm. is. So let's say the property is negative a year at the moment and you've bought it in the right name, you've bought it in the person's name who's on the higher tax bracket. So you're getting the $15,000 refund as opposed to the $6,400 refund. So that's the correct thing in the short term. Now, over time, that property will become positive a year. And then once it becomes positive a year, then you're paying tax at the highest tax rate. Yeah. And then you're in the wrong name at that point. Yeah. So then you'd say, well, okay, I'll just move it across to my spouse who's on the lower tax bracket. But then by doing that, you're triggering stamp duty, which yeah. is quite significant. And also there could be capital gains tax yeah. on moving across. So as you can see, it's it's uh, it's not something that you can just buy without considering these things. So you need to go through each of these taxes and um, work out whose name is it best to buy in. Now, um, there's a there's there's a lot of companies and trusts and so forth that you can and, and it's appropriate in, in, in circumstances but but that's it for another uh, yeah. session but this is something a bit of your secret sauce is that potentially you can have your cake and eat it where you can get some of the tax benefits in the high bracket to start off with correct but then later shift it to someone in a lower tax bracket when it becomes positive with gear is that right and correct. that's through some of the advanced planning and strategies and you know particularly your property investment trust correct you can facilitate so correct. we won't di uh, dive deep into that today but it just shows you that you know the the unicorn here has been able to try to get the benefit now in the short term and the long term and this is something you guys have not just cracked recently but for a number of years yes are able to show people how to get benefits of both correct so yeah. what we've tried to do is to get our cake and eat it too yeah and uh, it can be achieved yeah. And uh, and and um, it's because uh, we've spent the time and the money to uh, develop that. Uh, it's called a property investor trust, but again, it's for another day. Excellent, great. Thanks, Well, let's move to the next slide. So here again, one, one of the biggest questions, do I buy old or new? Can you sh talk to us about the ramifications of buying an older property versus a new property and what depreciation's impact has as well? Absolutely, the, the depreciation has a, has a huge impact on, on, on your investment because it's a deduction that you get on paper where you don't have to actually fork out any money. So negative gearing, the concept of negative gearing is when you're losing money, when you lose, when there's more money going out than coming in. But the beauty about depreciation is it's an expense that's just on paper. So it's a, probably the best legal deduction you can get. Now, if you buy a new property, you get that. If you buy an old property, you don't get that. So 
the, the numbers are exactly the same. So I'll take you right down to the to the bottom four mm -hmm. lines where the, the red pieces are, so mm -hmm. that we can uh, get, um, cut to the chase. So the refund for assuming a forty eight point five percent tax rate, the maximum tax rate that you pay in Australia. Um, if you're buying a new property, your refund is around fifteen thousand five hundred and twenty dollars. Six hundred and forty on the same size value property, but one's new, one's with depreciation, one with without. And the difference there is around four grand a year. Well, Eighty dollars a week. So Eighty dollars yeah, a week. Yeah. And that's one property. So yeah. if you get two or three or four or five, you've got ten properties, that's eight hundred. And so forth. So it's it can compounding effect. Yes, and and again, it's it's just money for jam. There's yeah. no, you don't have to fork out any money for it. It comes in every year. It's an expense for your property, and so it's a it's a great thing. Yeah, great. We're just about to move on to another um, tax to unpack, but you can see obviously the money you saved in the in the previous uh, example, just on the uh, income tax, add to that the depreciation benefit. You add those amounts, it becomes a quite a significant amount each year. Yes. But it's not that just that, you know, as a counter, you, you talk to the effect of compounding returns because that money you save would also be put against the loan and Absolutely. the interest saved on that for the next 15, 20 years compounds dramatically. So it's not just the, those amounts you save today, it's the amounts you save over time. So we, we kept it simple in the calculation, but yes. you can see the compounding effect that is quite considerable. So uh, here's the other one that a lot of people miss out on. And unfortunately, again, I, I've seen this and it's, it's quite painful and people go buy properties in joint names or mm -hmm. uh, the incorrect name. And they get hit by a state tax called land tax. So if you could talk to great. that, Ed, that'd be great. Yes, I'll, I'll just stick to New South Wales at the yeah. moment because we, we do have limited time. Mm. But the, the 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 land tax around the country is very similar, mm. although their thresholds are a little bit different. So New South Wales, the threshold is six hundred and twenty nine thousand. Now I'm talking about land value only, um, Sam, not not the property value. Sure. So let's be very clear on that. So typically, what happens is that if you don't plan out your investments. And you go to an accountant who's not very familiar with um, with property. They'll say, "Well, buy, you know, buy the properties in your joint names." Um, and in this case, the first property is six hundred thousand because that's in joint names and it's under the land tax threshold. There's no tax, as you can see. Then they come to buy the second property and they say the land value of that is three hundred grand. And then now they've triggered a, a, a land tax bill of four thousand four hundred and thirty-six because it's now above the land tax threshold. Of, you know, so if you add the two properties together, it's 900 grand. But the problem um, occurs, it, it, it escalates. Mm. So the third property you buy, your total land value is now what is 1.2 mil, mm. and your total land tax is $9,236 per annum. Okay, now if you've done a little bit of tax planning with the right person, then you can see that we can avoid that completely. So um, as you can see on the left, on the left there, there's Tony, Sue, and Sue. So we're buying the properties in the different names. So let's say we bought the first property in Tony's name. And if I go down, go across to the right, the the prop the the joint ownership of the joint properties and joint names, as we had in the past, there was no tax on there on the, that fourth column across. Um, if you go down to the next line, you can see we buy the second property in Sue's name. And if we go across to the to the fourth column, that's the, the, the joint um, um, land tax value was 4,436. Mm -hmm. But because Sue picks up a second land tax threshold, there's no tax on there. And we buy the third one in Sue's name, and her property now is un her total property is now under uh, the land tax threshold, and there's no land tax uh, on her properties at all. So you've gone from paying $9,236 a year to no tax at all, just on those, yeah. on those properties. And it's because two people get a threshold, people naively just let's buy it, equal names and what have you, not realizing that just by, um, you know, simply buying them in the same name, you're exposed to a lot of land tax. And this is not a static equation either, because over time the land value increases absolutely, and it begins to escalate. And then you'll be swearing a lot and wondering yes. why you didn't get the advice at the beginning. In, in fact, <laughs> in fact, you'll, that 9,236 is in one year. If you held yeah. that property for 10 years, that's $92,000. Yeah. You could have avoided in yeah. paying, uh, not not paid yeah. because it's uh, yeah, structured right. properly. Yeah. And what's yes. interesting, you don't get, if you if you think you buy buying joint names, do you both get to split that value, land value in half, it doesn't. You just no. automatically get one threshold. So okay. you immediately disqualify. Them. And just a yeah. quick comment. Yeah. Now, of course, if, you're, if Sue was on a lower tax bracket, yeah. 
that's going to affect you from an income tax perspective as well. So yeah, so it's it's, it's yeah. This, it's this is the complexity in the matrix of, of trying to manage all of these taxes at once and thread the needle. And that's why it's important. So again, if and look, Ed, you've been great to um, detail the difference or the impact just on those taxes in isolation. But now, if we just look at this on one property right. and not really assuming any massive appreciation of land value, just the the cost of that combined. You could talk of this now here. Yes, absolutely. So let's let's um, let's say you you had you bought an old one versus a new one over a twenty year period, and that's not not um, unusual to own a property for twenty years. There's around seventy seven thousand six hundred you would have you would have missed out on. Mm. So you would have had to you would you would have paid when you didn't have to pay it. Mm. And then uh, right and wrong name is around one hundred seventy nine thousand two hundred that uh, in tax that you could have. Um, not pay as opposed to paying and then uh, of course if you had it in a wrong name from a capital gains tax perspective the person the capital gains tax is payable at the person's marginal tax rate mm. so if it was paid at the spouse's level is a lot less than perhaps at the other spouse's level who's got who's on a higher tax bracket there's around one hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars in tax that's um that, that's extra tax that you're paid when you didn't have to mm. And from a land tax perspective, um, not structured and crop correctly, you could easily pay over $184,000 just by having it in joint names and not in the right names. And if you add that up, that's over 600 grand, and which you could have not paid, mm -hmm. but because you didn't know or because you had the wrong advice, because the advisor, your accountant didn't, didn't specialize in this, didn't understand this, you could have ended up paying it. That well, that's significant. And again, it is where we're probably finding a lot is that clients aren't interested just in one property, but building a portfolio and mm -hmm. potentially buying a second or a third property. We can see the impact both in the short term and the long term as it affects your cash flow, it affects your right. servicing, you know, money that you could use to pay off non-deductible debt like a home loan. So it, it is, it's really critical that you get that. And you can ignore it for the first or the second year, but over time, it actually becomes very, very um, painful yes. realizing that. So just before we go, we're going to open up to some questions in a moment to Ed. I just want to give a little background on DPN. As I mentioned, we work with uh, Chan and Naylor, a number of other firms. And um, what we do, we're a property investment uh, um, company, work in financial services for a number of years, also background in financial planning. We've won a number of awards. But what we do for our clients and, and other professionals' clients is that we provide for them a, um, a, a research-driven approach to buying properties. We work with people to give them a property investment plan that allows them to look at their current situation, what they've got to model out to look at becoming financially independent because people do want to stop working one day and have an income stream and they like property as an asset class. Instead of just jumping on a realestate.com.au and just buying something out of emotion, it's good to do all the modeling, understand the numbers, and something that's specific to you, just like um, Ed would never give advice to anyone generally uh, over a webinar or anything like that or without understanding a specific situation. So it's so important when buying property, you don't just buy one just because your friend bought one in the same complex and that. You need to get something specific to your cash flow, your affordability, your comfort level, your risk level. They're all the things that are important. And what you want to do is on a research-based point of view versus some form of marketing where someone, some developer is just trying to flog something through it. So you want to see all of the data around the vacancy rates, around the growth rates, and you need to also know what time in the market because, as you understand, there's a, there's a multiplicity of property markets in Australia. And at the moment, we, we can listen to the media and they might generalise that the Sydney market is correcting at this moment. That doesn't mean that... that there's nowhere to invest. You just need to be forensic and research the right areas. So what we do is provide a very clear step-by-step -step process. We do a property investment plan. It's no charge. This at least shows you where you're at now, could review existing properties that you have. We would then, once we do this plan, it models out how many properties you should really consider buying over your working career. So you can then swap places at some point and those properties can provide you an income stream. You'll see on step two there that it's part of structuring and that's where we'd actually make sure before we go out and add any more properties is hand you over to an, you know, a, a proficient accountant or advisor that would help make sure that your structures are correct before we build a foundation of wealth or buy you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of property to make sure we structure again, not, not only even for this generation, it's sometimes it's the generations to come to think of how to transfer that wealth. And it's so important to have that planning. So, uh, uh, you know, again, at the end of the seminar, you're more than welcome to, you know, connect either with us or Chan Nala. There's some um, uh, contact emails there or websites that you can go on there, see a bit about our firms. But what we're going to do now is I'm going to hand back to Ed and I'm going to read out a question with, that's been sent to us from uh, Mabel Ong. 
And uh, just bear with me, it's fairly long, this question, but it, uh, and this might even lead into another seminar later, but Mabel asks, uh, my basic understanding is that a trust is best for asset protection. However, when you purchase a property, it is often done through borrowing and it would be negatively geared, which means the trust would be in losses. Although losses can be carried forward to be utilized in later years, if the trust is, is a discretionary trust, be extremely difficult to utilize the losses unless you can pass the pattern of distribution test, which would be hard to satisfy if you're being discretionary with the distributions. What is your current recommended structure for matching interest deductions and rental income from the purchased investment property? And would this structure be for both residential and commercial properties? And just before I get Ed to answer that, if you have any other questions, please just type them in the dialogue box there and send them through, and we'll see if we can answer them after this. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sam. And, and thanks, Mabel, for your question. It's a, a really good question. Um, the, the answer to it is, is that um, there are different types of trust out there and, um, and we're going to do another session on this because it will take you know, another half an hour to, uh, to go through them all. But, but the, the, there's different types of trust and the trusts are used for different things. For example, the one that you mentioned, which is a discretionary trust or a family trust, often they're called family trust, you would never use to buy a property in for lots of reasons. One of them is the, the quarantine of the negative gearing, as you correctly mentioned. So if the property is negatively geared, it gets quarantined inside that trust. So you're not able to offset that loss, those losses against your wages. So it's it, those, those um, losses are, are, are lost against your current wages. It can be carried forward, but what's the point in carrying it forward when you can use other structures that can you can get the benefit of it straight away. Now there's other trusts like a unit trust, although a unit trust has what's called an E4 problem. So when you come to sell the property, you end up paying a little bit more capital gains tax than you would if you had it in another structure. Um, you can use a hybrid trust, um, but the ATOs put out a tax alert on a hybrid trust. They don't like them, and they've been trying to shut them down for years. And um, we've developed a, a property investor trust, which has an ATO product ruling. So it's the only product that's um, of this nature that's got a product ruling in Australia. It has no vesting date, so it doesn't die, if you like, after 80 years, like most of the other trusts. And, um, and that's a trust that would be applicable. But the, the bottom line is, is Mabel, that um, there's no one structure that fits everybody. So we have to look at your situation. So if you need asset protection, but you're buying the property in New South Wales, we'd not, we would not put you into a trust because trusts in New South Wales do not get a land tax threshold. So you end up losing the land tax threshold. And um, there's another way to do it. So we would put you in, we'd buy it in your own name, but do an equity bank trust to, to help you protect your assets. Now, there's different variations to all of that, and I'll go to a lot of lot more detail in the next yeah. in the next webinar, but um, just just to, to answer your um, questions briefly, <laughs> um, it's not a family trust you would use in that situation. Thanks, Ed, and look, uh, Mabel, thanks for the question. You can see that, again, the skill and expertise you need to have, uh, and, that, and a lot of accountants would just just pull a trust off the shelf and they could buy a template and go from there. But you can see the value of great advice. So thanks once again for joining us today. And again, encourage you to visit Chan Nail if you need good advice, visit DPN. We've got some great uh, products. Check out our, our dual income products, which are cash flow positive from day one. Or if you haven't got a property investment plan or never thought of doing something like that, I'd really encourage you to register on our website and get that. Thanks once again, Ed. I really appreciate uh, your uh, speaking to us today. Uh, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me.